Hello, everybody, and welcome to Planet FPL, the world where everything revolves around Fantasy Premier League. My name is Serge. And my name is James. Season five. Whoop, whoop. Season five. Um, yeah, I mean, we pod every bloody day, so it's sometimes a bit difficult to know where some things end and other things start. But it is season five, and uh, it feels like five is an interesting number because our, our friends at WGTA starting season five. I was listening to Amigos, it's season five for them as well. It just feels like five is the magic number. Season five, episode one. Are you suggesting we all start with 5.0 defenders or uh, players who wear number five, or basically we've all been in this community for a similar amount of time? What are you suggesting? I think it's it's more the growth in the community has is the last five years, isn't it, really? That's when it all kind of kicked off. And I think um, this year is... I'm, I'm looking forward to this year playing FPL more than ever before, I think. Why? Um, I would have to say that if anyone called me up until now in my FPL career, if anyone called me casual, they were probably being very generous. To, like, I don't think I really understood the game and the nuances of the game well enough. I feel like this year I'm going into it armed with the right decision-making processes and all the rest of it. So I'm actually, I know it sounds stupid, I'm taking it more seriously. I'd like to see some serious results this year. He says uh, getting glared at. Some. For, those, for those who are new to Planet FPL, are you suggesting you've got a plan? Um, because this might lose us a lot of listeners if you A have. loose plan. Like, this is the thing, right? Uh, everyone's, it, it's what's, I can't remember who the boxer is, but they, they also, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. So uh, yeah, game week two will be the punch in the face that makes me go back to the good old ways. You think you'll um, make it that long, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Game week one will be fine. Um, although I feel like this last four or five days, we've all been taking a few punches to the ribs uh, here and there with uh, injuries and uh, new signings and shock news and and so on and so on as i saw our friend fpl general tweet over the weekend all this planning just to land after game week one with a rank of 5.5 million i was tempted yep. to tweet him back and say i don't think the insider are aiming that high actually mate no well uh let me just check how many players are in the game right now james well there's this... gonna be shit loads more this week mate there's 3.5 so if we've got a rank of 5.5 with the current three and a half million players that's quite low Although I reckon that will get up to five and a half, six. Yeah, think, think of all them robots that are getting formed in the next four days or so, mate. Loads. Yep. Yeah, it'll be about 5.5 million, 6 million by kickoff, I'd say. And then by the time we get into September or so, it'll probably be about 9 million, I reckon. Mm. Yep, 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 yep. Um, yeah. How are you feeling about the season coming up? All right, all right. I think... Um, Last week for us, I kind of explained to people on Twitter last night, it was almost like intense pre-season for us, having all the correspondents come on, do the 20 pods on each team. Um, doing 25 pods in a week, is it's not going to get bigger than that for us. It's our biggest week of the year. So now I'm ready to go. We've got all the information as best we can from the 20 teams. We've spoke to people whose opinion we very much trust during Content Creator Week. We took a little bit of time out with EFL week. We've obviously focused heavily on the Euros during the summer. I feel like, yeah, pre-season is over and now it's ready to go into the game weekend. Time. And yeah, it is. It's game, it's, time. It's, it's game time now. Yeah, I'm mm. thinking about Manchester City on Sunday from a personal perspective. But yeah, I'm ready for FPL as well. Your voice is a little hoarse. Is that from yesterday shouting at the uh, No, not, the not that much. Not that much. Not that much. Well, you went to the friendly yesterday. I mean, there's friendlies all weekend. Go, I'm obviously uh, um, new listeners may not have come across. James is a season to gold at Spurs. I have a season to get to West Ham. We've had a solid preseason. It fills me with a little bit of uh, nervousness when preseason goes well. It's like the wheels are going to come off as soon as, as soon as the season starts. But we've had a very solid preseason in terms of build up. I haven't been hasn't been too many. Uh, big injury concerns. Like Bonner seems to be the only one that might um, that's got a bit of a knock and a, a bit of a struggle. Uh, ben Rahm has been playing really well. Antonio survived all of preseason without getting an injury. It will survive about twenty um, minutes. Again yeah, well, as soon as the season starts, all changes. <laughs> but we, we've had a solid preseason. Look, the the clubs 
social media accounts aren't going to tweet any negative stuff, but the general mood in amongst the camp seems seems decent, seems positive. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the season from that kind of point of view as well. Right? Yeah, a football season to look forward to with Mourinho nowhere to be seen. Yes, I'm really mm. looking did forward to it. Did you see he got season. sent off on the weekend? I did, and three of his players <laughs> got sent off as well in a friendly. As in you a are. friendly. Right, come on. That's brilliant. And they That's conceded brilliant. five. Mm. Defensive manager, you know. What a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so today's pod, to kick the season off, we're talking about strategy, chips, and we've got a bit of a watch list on certain players that we're thinking as well. Um, and from a kind of strategy point of view, you've got short term and long term. What do we do in the first kind of four to six game weeks? How are we going to navigate them? And then obviously looking further ahead to chips um, and so on, because as you as you said to me off air before we started recording, last season was um, way trickier to navigate than this season with the latest start, winter break, COVID issues that could have arisen and so on and so on. So what are your thoughts now on um, on this season versus last and how we set ourselves up long term? Well, I think the big message we got from Content Creator Week, uh, and it, it seems to be a theme in the Twitter FPL community more than I've seen previously, is a it's OK to start with the template. Yep. Um, and because of some of the ownership of certain big name players, I think there is a real fear of punching against it and missing is going to leave you broken before we hit September. So it does seem more of a concerted effort than what I've seen in previous years to try and be on that template at the start. Now, no one really wants the 11 players of template. We should have a couple of differentials in there, but I think not too far away from it is, is the thinking. Whereas in the past, I probably tried to punch quite far away from the template early on. And to be honest, it's never done me much good to to hammer no. against it and like game week one last year no salah and stuff like that you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go against that this year when i know his effective ownership with captaincy at the weekend is surely going to be well in excess of 100 percent. so i template thinking which as i said in previous years i wouldn't have focused too much on it's season five episode one and my son has decided to walk into the podcast arena <laughs> 10 minutes in Hello, son. How are you doing? Please talk for a moment, Suj. No problem. I mean, I, uh, I I was adamant I was going into game week one with Trent and Robbo. Robbo's picked up a knock. My first instant transfer and the easy one is picking the most highly owned defender in the game in short, which is as template as it can get. But I look at it and now he's he's obviously played at the weekend and has gone from high 40s now to 52%. Going to up, it's think, simple, well. right? I'm, I'm, I'm literally just thinking, yeah, I'm going to stick with with template um, in in terms of ownership. Trent is next highest owned, I think, in in terms of defensive assets. Let's look here. I had team selected by, um, so I, I own Trent, uh, I own Ben White, and I own Luca Dean. That's four of the top five defenders in terms of ownership. Sanchez is my um, goalkeeper. He's the second most known goalkeeper. I'm discounting Ben Foster there because he's a bench filler as opposed to a selected goalkeeper. Um, midfielders, Salah, most highly owned. Rafinha, fifth, owned both of them. Um, and up top, Tony and Watkins. I own both of them, although Watkins we'd have to talk about. And Antonio's fifth on the list. So of, the, of my squad and my team, the majority are in the top four or five most owned players so far and um when i get rid of ollie watkins which i, I think i am going to do um i'm only going to look i'm only going to go more template again potentially yeah that luke shaw is a perfect case example we spoke about him a lot with with gary on episode 12 of carry um correspondent week and i feel like i've been looking for reasons not to have him and part of those reasons are my instinctual nature is that guy's too highly owned his ownership is much bigger than what it should be in my opinion and, and that opinion hasn't changed but I think big man backer from the wire summed it up best on Twitter yesterday when he posted some stats of Shaw's chance creation over the previous uh the sort of the second half of last season it's basically the highest looking at it and going don't overthink this he's his ownership's in excess of 50 percent they've got Leeds Southampton Wolves Newcastle was the first four which is pretty decent it's not impossible they could walk away from that from four, four clean sheets. I'm sure they won't. 
but like don't overthink it james mm -hmm. like i'm gonna pro almost definitely go with him we, we discussed that when tom Cantwell come on weeks ago on content create week almost like if it looks like he's going to play in game week one and now it does you almost look like you've probably got to go with it yeah but then the rubbers where i'm going to go against so those who've been listening during our preseason probably not my intention as it stands now is not to go with Bruno Fernandes. And my reasoning on that is that I'd probably captain him once in the first 11 game weeks and therefore £12 million is too much. But then I'm not sitting here and going, oh, Bruno's a bad pick. Don't own anybody else pick him. I know he can hurt me. I know he's very capable. I've just highlighted those first four fixtures. So if anybody wants to go with him, go with him. I've got my reasoning for why I'm not. So that's one way I'm swinging against the template. Me too. But I don't think there's many where you should probably swing against it at the moment. No. The, no. the other that's that's crept up um, quite high is obviously Jack Grealish post his move to City. He's at like 29% now, and I can see that rising. Um, but again, with, I mean, City weren't great on, on Saturday. Um, I wouldn't yeah, judge was, City. In no, I mean, the team, the team was out, yeah, yeah. Part of Cole Palmer and um, the lad on the left and so on. It wasn't their full strength team by any stretch, but still, uh, De Bruyne, Foden and so on are still injured. I'm not really um, piling into City just yet, despite that game week two fixture against Norwich. So, yeah, I mean, I feel fairly comfortable going with the template. You're right. Should we talk a bit of chips? Chips. So every preseason, I do a little bit on chips and strategy for the season. The good news for people is this is far less complicated than it was this time last year. It's quite straightforward. So first of all, I think we should probably have a, a brief discussion about what are your thoughts going into the season on first wild card? The silence is so good for the podcast. Okay, so my thoughts are uh, we have advocated and um, probably to our detriment would advocate keeping it as long as possible if you don't need to, right? Um, just to, to help you navigate it. But I think it's the stubbornness in you and me that maybe because of last year makes us want to keep it till game week 10, 11, 12, 13. When people are pulling the, the wild card in game week four, five, and six, it's like I know better, and I'm. It's going to be more valuable to me in six or seven or eight weeks' time. So, um, I think I'm just being more open-minded to it. If I need to pull the trigger on it, I need to pull the trigger on it. Simple as that. Um, I, I'm going to try my best to be more open-minded about it. I'd like to almost, I probably wouldn't like to, but it'd be nice if like four players got injured in one week then I knew I had to use it kind of thing. If my hand was forced... You wishing ill harm on it. players. So, well, that's the thing. I obviously don't wish it. But if your hand is forced sometimes with injuries uh, or suspensions, then you get forced into using your wild card. Um, so, yeah. It, one of the things that came from um, the podcast with uh, Mark Southerns was always fix the weakest link, right, in your team. Don't always think about, to, to look at the weakest link. If I've got three or four weak links all at the same time, I'm going to pull the trigger on the wild card, I think, for sure. Oh, you'd be pulling it in game week two then, I'm sure. My team's going to be, have 10 players the same as yours, mate, if we're all going to the template. So uh, if I am, everyone is. Um, last year, I was very insistent on holding the wild card right till the last possible moment, uh, the first mm. wild card, purely because I knew that sort of, blank game week 18 double game week 19 was going to happen we haven't got anything like that this year and i think most people would advocate using that wild card early there's a number of reasons for that one you can be aggressive in terms of building your budget um two you fix the problems because the reality is going into the season everybody thinks they've got the best team everybody so when so when you're asking for advice, you got to be conscious at the moment that everybody's got the same budget, everybody's got the same 15 choices. So when someone gives you advice, they're probably going to lean into what their own personal opinion is, even if it doesn't necessarily help you with yours. I would like to hold it again, but I'm very prepared to, to use it early. As I said, I think most people would probably say, yeah, look, use it early. I think... There were a couple of key points where you can use it early on. International breaks are overhyped in terms of how much you can build your squad value. It never seems to transpire as much as people think it should over a two-week period. At the end of the day, 
one week between games or two week between games, you're probably still getting a similar number of transfers. Yeah. And you get that kind of dead period during the international break where there's like a week between sort of Wednesday and Wednesday where no one's doing anything. So it's overhyped, but there are fixture swings for game week four this year. Arsenal, Wolves, Leeds, Leicester coming in game week five. It's a good period to to swing with the fixtures. I think there are two other periods I'd highlight, which are really interesting. And I'm going to call them by their, their team names. So the game week seven wildcard, I would call the Chelsea wildcard. Yep where Chelsea suddenly from difficult fixtures, Tottenham away, Man City at home, walk into Southampton, Brentford, Norwich, Newcastle, Burnley. And if Lukaku's at the football club by then, he's, there's every chance he's going to be the most popular captain five weeks in a row. And you're going to want some Chelsea coverage for those five fixtures. So there's the Chelsea wildcard. That's also an international break the week after as well, between seven and eight. And the other one further along is the Manchester United wildcard where they go into a period with Arsenal at home in game week 14. And then this astonishing run from game week 15 to game week 26. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got a period of sort of 11 games in there and they'd be targeting 28 points or so, I should imagine. So that's the idea. I've, I, I, I like the Manchester United wildcard idea. And there's another reason I really like the, the, the hold until then if it's possible, is there's problems afoot for Chelsea in game week 17 and 18. They're due to play Everton at home and Wolves away. And those two games are highly likely, we haven't got it officially confirmed yet, but those two games are highly likely to be postponed for the Club World Cup. Giving them a blank, it'll obviously also give Everton a blank and Wolves a blank as well. So, so are you implying then with that that you come off Chelsea to United by game week 14 to avoid Chelsea in 17-18? Well, their fixtures in at that period as well. Chelsea got West Ham away 15, Leeds at home in 16. They're not fixtures to be feared, but they're also no. not fixtures where you'd not expect great. them to go off massive either. Mm. And they're games that, in theory, they could get beaten in. Um, so that's part of the idea. It's more that it's more to get into Manchester United. Because United's run, as we've discussed, game week five to 14 is pretty grim, actually. Mm, yeah, I mean, it's two ways of looking at it as well. For me, I'm not starting with any Chelsea players right now, and I'm not likely to have any. So am I going to manoeuvre my way to three Chelsea players between game week one and game week seven? Or even one Chelsea player and then roll a transfer into game week seven to pick up another two? Is it easier for me to do that than for me to, between 7 and 14, manoeuvre my way to three Manchester United players. And that's very much always dictated by what other fires do I have to put out. I can see myself manoeuvring myself to three Chelsea players through my free transfers between game week one and seven. But perhaps moving to three Manchester United players for game week 14 might be trickier, depending on who I own. Um, but again, I'm going into game week one with one Manchester United player no Chelsea players. At the moment, my thinking is then to wildcard later. But unlike last year, where honestly, I was not for turning in terms of using that first wildcard. This year, if I'm not happy, I'll pull the trigger whenever. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my strategy is long-term thinking, but knowing that it could very quickly become short-term. I'm not set into when I'm using that wildcard. Now, I know there are a lot of people going into the season who are planning just for the first three weeks. I know they want to wild card in that international break. And that's absolutely fine if you want to do that. The advice, obviously, if you are going down that strategy, you hammer those first three fixtures. So you really would definitely be looking for definite Aston Villa coverage with their first Triple three up. fixtures, for example. <clears throat> to be honest, yes, I would. If I if I knew I was wild card in game week four, I would go Treble Villa. Yeah, I would I would almost definitely have Emmy Martinez in goal, for example, yeah. and then two attacking. Wendy and uh, whoever else. If yeah. It, <laughs> <laughs> like the problem with everybody at the moment. One thing I would say on the wild card though, James, is I'm unlikely to use it before game week four. Only because um I want to get a reasonable amount of data in before I pull the trigger. So yeah, you might find that a number of your players don't play in game week one and you worry and panic and pull the trigger, but I need three or four weeks worth of data to see how a team's setting up, who actually is the starting lineup and the preferred selections, players coming back from injury or international tournaments or whatever else. So 
I'm not, even if game week one is really bad, I'm unlikely to, uh, injuries aside, I'm unlikely to pull the trigger in game week two or three. I need at least three or four weeks worth of data and then I'll feel comfortable to say, okay, oh, hang on, Che Adams is playing up top on his own or not, whatever. Yeah. Part why Chelsea's important in terms of chip strategy is knowing that there's a fair chance you might want to put your triple captaincy on a Chelsea player this season. Part because of what I mentioned, they're likely to have two games postponed. There is a catch to that. After the game week 18 fixture, the midweek afterwards is the Carabao Cup quarterfinals. Now, should they already be eliminated from the competition and one of their two opponents be eliminated, I guess there's every chance it could be played that week midweek. So it could be that Chelsea just play in the midweek rather than the weekend and it becomes a, a normal game week for them. Or it could be that they have a single fixture and we'd end up with a, a double for, I think Wolves is their first opponent, I want to say, uh, in game week. Uh, no, it's Everton first. So you there's a small possibility that Everton could blank in 17 and then have a double in 18. But in terms of doubles early part of the season, unless something happens with COVID, it's not going to happen. And I think even if something did happen with COVID, we're still probably unlikely to get any doubles prior to that sort of game week 17, 18 period. And that's because every midweek that's available is filled up by either European football or Carabao Cup football. The first midweek that's not is essentially would be that kind of the midweek after game week 18, where it's the quarterfinals and you've got enough teams that are already out of the competition where it becomes a possibility. Arguably, you've got the fourth round after game week nine if there was an early COVID postponement and if both teams were out of the cup as well, I guess there's a possibility. But we're not going to have doubles early in the season. So when would Chelsea's rearranged fixtures go? Well, as Ben Krellin's pointed out, there is a small possibility of a treble game week in game week 21. Um, that's because... Between game week 21, which is New Year's Day, and game week 22 is two weeks later. You've FA got both, Cup fourth round in there? Uh, you, FA Cup third round. Third and, round, sorry, yeah. And the midweeks are the both Carabao Cup semifinals. Right. So again, if Chelsea are out of the competition, and as are Wolves and Everton as well, it is feasible that Chelsea could play the two rearranged fixtures in those midweeks of the Carabao Cup semifinal and have a treble game week, game week 21, for the record, their other fixture is Liverpool. But if they had a treble game week, which unlike Manchester United's last season, yeah. would, be, would be That was over five days, wasn't it? Mm, this, this is over probably 14, 50, more well, even. It, it, would, it would probably be over sort of 11 days or so. Right. Then you'd be very interested, especially with the FA Cup third round to break in the middle, where you mm. know some players would get their rest there. Rest. Yeah. You'd be very interested in the Lukaku or Havertz for the, the treble captaincy. I would Correct. say that's unlikely. And one of the reasons that's unlikely is obviously Chelsea are in the Champions League this year. And you do get those two free midweeks where the last 16 is spread over four midweeks, yep. isn't it? Yep. Yep. So those are the most likely dates. So Chelsea will have two doubles possibly in the, in the 20s fixtures, depending on where the Champions League dates were fitting. Obviously, should they finish third in the group and drop into the Europa League, it becomes a problem. And that would really open up the prospect of game week 21. We could sit here now and say, well, Chelsea won't drop into the Europa League. Well, last time they won the Champions League, they did exactly that. They finished third right. in the group and dropped into the Europa League. Admittedly, Andre Villas-Boas was their manager then. Or was no, Roberto Di Matteo uh, and, then, and then Rafa Benitez took over. But it was, it was Di Matteo that couldn't get them out of the group. Anyway, it's the if they dropped in the Europa League, I think that really would make that treble game week 21 a possibility. In terms of other big doubles, the other big double game week is likely to be game week 36. So we've got a blank in game week 27 for the Carabao Cup final. Uh, the midweek of the FA Cup fifth round is the midweek immediately afterwards. Again, if you've got one of the Champions League clubs get into that final, is every chance it's going to fit into one of those Champions League midweeks. midweeks. Yeah, exactly that. Game week 30 is the FA Cup quarterfinals. That's likely yep. to be your big blank of the season. We only had, what, four fixtures last year, Serge? Mm -hmm. And actually, it should have been three 
but they fit in the Moved. postponed Aston Villa top and Villa fixture back Spurs. into there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But ordinarily, you'll get five or six postponements and sort of only eight to ten teams playing that game week. So that's obviously a possibility for a free hit to cover you off and cover the blank game week is one possibility. Immediately following that is the international break and then game week 31, the other side. Of course, what a lot of people also like to do is dead end into that game week, wild card on the other side. But then 31 to a potential bench boost, if you want to bench boost in the biggest double, which is likely to be 36, that's quite quite a long period. Mm. Exactly that. So in terms of other free midweeks, we do have uh, after game week 33, there is a free midweek where there's no European football or anything, but it's the FA Cup semifinals that weekend as well. So it could just be that we have the postponed FA Cup semifinals, the games postponed because of the semifinals, just get played the midweek afterwards and game week 33 would be as per normal. And it could be all the postponed game week 30 fixtures from the quarterfinals go into game week 36 to give us the biggest double. Now, as per usual, I'm sure what will happen is some of the 30 fixtures will go into 33 and we'll get a bit of a mix. And some of the 33 fixtures will go into 36. It was also a partial free midweek after game week 37, which is likely to give us more blanks because the FA Cup final is again on the weekend of game week 37. So you might be thinking, well, why 36 going to be bigger than 37? The very simple reason for that. The Europa League final this year is being played on the Wednesday. between Before the end of the season? Yeah, between game right. weeks 37 and game week 38. Right. Now, that's obviously going to be on a Wednesday. We know that UEFA allows certain clashes. They ain't going to allow a Premier League mm. clash with their Europa League final, I'm fairly certain. So any midweek fixtures that week would have to be played on the Tuesday, of course. I've already booked my flights and uh, hotel for that one. Well, I was going to say, let's just say <laughs> that the FA Cup final happens to be West Ham v Leicester and the Europa League final happens to be West Ham v Leicester. When does the game get played? Well, there'd have to be some some working around that might be a little yeah. bit complicated, actually. And that could lead to an unlikely scenario where we get fixtures jammed into perhaps game week 33, for example. But this year's strategy is much more straightforward than what it's been in previous years. 30, big blank. 36, likely big double. 33, some teams blanking, some teams doubling is kind of what we're looking at. And the only thing that's probably going to change against that is obviously COVID situation. And if we get unique situations like that, West Ham v Leicester being Mm. the Europa League final, which and one of them making the FA Cup final would throw stuff and make it a little bit awkward to plan for. But I'm pretty sure in that case, you could argue there's a possibility of a treble in 36 if they planned it properly, but I'm sure they'd find ways and contingencies. It's, it's quite straightforward this year compared to last year. So in terms of that early wild card, most people like to use the second wild card to build to the bench boost. That is always the debate and it happens every year when the big double looks like it's going to be late like this year is that's too late to be using the second wild card Mm -hmm. and i don't particularly disagree with that so one argument might be that you might want to hold the free hit for 36 yeah there's a possibility and rather than bench boosting it and then you just find to be honest you find another scenario where bench boost works really well for you if you've got that week where just suddenly it looks like you've got 15 good players or perhaps the smaller double, like 33, for example. So perhaps wild card in 32, bench boost 33, free hit in 36. There are different way, different ways to skin it, of course, but this year's a lot more straightforward. And again, so that's why it, I, a little bit like last year, I don't want to use that wild card too early because I know me as a strategist, I want to use that second wild card in game with 35 to hammer the double. And I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but I know that's probably what I'll end up doing. Therefore, do I want a wild card in game week three and game week 35? Got 32 weeks to worry about in the middle. And I think the impulse always is something's wrong with my team. I have to fix it. So I didn't have a particularly good rank last year at 350k. I was still sitting at 4 million at game week 10 and not hitting the button and managed to manoeuvre through it. And then eventually wild card in between 18 19 got me jumped up from like 1.5 million to that point over it's a only couple of you weeks. uh you remember to hit your play your free hit 
<laughs> is helpful. So if you, yeah, if you're going to plan a free hit, it is helpful Use if you actually submit thing. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, that that gives a, a kind of overview on that. I'm I'm not overly worrying about uh, the second half of the season in terms of free hit and bench boost, which order I use them in until we get a bit closer to the time and we see what happens. Um, it, it wouldn't surprise me this year if we saw more Premier League teams going through in the cup competitions and so on. They've all got such good depth. So that could cause chaos for, for the Premier League fixtures. So I'm going to hold tight and wait and see. Another couple of things just to quickly note. Um, the African Cup of Nations yes. is in January, which is obviously likely to, I think, first thing everybody always thinks is, oh, that's a Salah, Mane, Liverpool problem. problem. It's not as bad as it looks. So actually, they're probably only going to miss two games for Liverpool. Mm. And that's if if they go far in the tournament. And those are game week 22 and game week 23. Liverpool's respective fixtures are Crystal Palace and Brentford. So it's not a disaster. They really should be able to manage that period. Interestingly, after game week 23, there's quite a break. So game week 23 is January the sec- uh, January 22nd. Game week 24 is February the 8th. You've got the FA Cup fourth round the weekend before that, February the 5th. And there's a big blank in the middle. Nothing happens on the 29th of January. And the reason for that is it's a little bit like a winter break in the sense that Premier League teams are not meant to be playing in those two weeks. But actually, the break is designed as an international break. Not for the European nations. It's designed for all the other confederations to catch up on their World Cup qualifiers. Right. That's why it's there. But I guess, in theory, if Chelsea didn't have Asian, North American, South American players all were happy to play a rearranged fixture in that period... And so were their opponents who weren't going to miss international uh, international players. I guess, in theory, it could go into game week 23. But there's a period there where it's likely to remain completely blank. And I would suggest the fact that the weekend back afterwards, being FA Cup fourth round, probably means that players can generally have a full week off or so. And then they can play weekend teams in the fourth round of the cup, etc. But that's just something to... To note, Europa League final, uh, as I said, is midweek between 37 38. Europa Conference League final, which when I'll obviously be in Albania supporting Tottenham, getting our pants yep. pulled down by Jose Mourinho's Roma inevitably, <laughs> is three days after game week 38. The Champions League final is the weekend afterwards. For me, the fixtures are quite straightforward this year. Nice. And That's Ben good. Krellin will cover everybody off if anyone's got any doubt. Anyway, so will a few others. Ian Parrin, Lego Mane, shout out those guys. If you don't know them on Twitter, brilliant people to give them a follow. They're all over strategy planning. Nice. Good, good, good. Um, watch list, James. Have You've put together your watch list of players um, for, for the season. Well, tomorrow we've got our, our advanced tier mini league winner on Patreon. Callum Mate is going to join us. We're going to look at kind of drafts and where they're at at the moment. Should we just have a run through by club? Kind of who's uh, in our thinking? Yes. The annoying thing is, I'm looking at the... So I've I've done my watch list on the official website. You've done it up to M. No, I've, I've, <laughs> I've got it all, but it doesn't sort by club, annoyingly. So should we do it by position? If you'd prefer to do that, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I can't sort this list by um, by club. <laughs> I, think it, I think it'd be more interesting just to go by the clubs. Yeah, okay, let's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll figure it out. Come we'll just on, go A to W and have a quick rundown of who's under consideration for our teams and who's not. Yep. Arsenal. Let's do it. Arsenal, I have uh Kieran Tierney. Yeah. Uh under consideration. I've put a Bamiyang on the watch list. <laughs> you fucking have not. <laughs> I have on the watch list. Look, he's he's and it's it's very it's very one Very watchy. Punny. That's literally all it can no, be. I'm not sorry. even. It's it's a case of he's that cheap compared to what he's been previously. The two seasons before last, he was 205 points. So I want to. I, I don't expect myself to buy him. I don't expect myself to own him. But the whole point of the watch list is who am I keeping an eye on just in case they go off? And Abamyang is on that list. Ben White is on that list as well. Although I don't know if he should be on the list or actually he's in my squad. So. There you go. Let's Callum not worry Cham- about who's in the squad at the moment. Yeah, Chambers is on that list from Arsenal as well. Um, and that's your lot. So, yeah, White, Tierney, Chambers and 
Aubameyang. No Smith Rowe? Uh, sorry, he's in my squad. So, yeah, him as well. Yeah, I think Tierney is a possible but unlikely for me because of Ben White's price. I like having Ben White in at 4.5. Good opening day fixture, horrible two and three, but then they do walk into a very good run from game week four. So kind of saves a possible transfer of interest in Arsenal ahead. And that's similar thinking with Smith Rowe, perhaps. Uh, on Chambers, Suj, I don't know if we can read anything into it, but obviously I was at Tottenham yesterday. Um, we played Arsenal. We beat Arsenal. Hector Bellerin played at right back. Uh, mm. Callum Chambers played the last half hour at centre back, replacing Ben White. Um, or Bamiang, mate. I no. You don't think I'll end, he's going to be good in? in good I'd, this season? I'd be astonished if you start this. Uh, everything we discussed about template, and you start with Bamiang. Oh, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry. <laughs> so this is not a watch list for game week one by any stretch. This is just, just the a watch, watch list. list. It's just the watch list. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. At some at some point in the season, I want to keep an eye on on this player just in case they pop up. No, no, not anywhere close to consideration for game week one. Okay. He'd have to, he'd have should, to score at least should, should five we just, and five. Should we just do the players under consideration for game week one? Oh, or, well, then Aubame- they've only got 15 because, huh? Or no. Bamiang, for me, could only no. be one where you'd make a debate for it, in my opinion. You go, I uh, quite fancy Brentford opening day. Kane was going to join Man City this week and you, you you were halfway there to get in or Bamiang to Kane for game week two. No, he's not at it. That's you and me. That's a, a miscommunication. I thought this is a watch list that these are the players that I would look at had I, if I needed to make a transfer. Rule, but about me, if you're going to do that, you wouldn't rule anybody out because then I think Saka, Pepe, you know, even yeah. Lacazette, if he stays at the club, could all come under consideration at some stage. So, yeah, I mean, we'd have 100 players on the watch list otherwise. But I think game week one is probably White and Smith Row really. Cheap mm-hmm. start. Villa. Aston Villa, I, uh, Martinez, um, although I'm, uh, it's highly unlikely. Um, and then it's Ings and Watkins and Buendia. Sorry, Ings, Watkins and Buendia. Yeah, same players for me. I've seen a bit of a growing for Matt Target. Um, I'm pretty sure I did play and start for Villa against in their rearranged friendly against Lernitana yesterday. Martinez is still under consideration for me. Ings, Watkins, Buendia. The closer it's getting, and now these there, there is doubts about Buendia and Watkins at the moment. It's possibly leaning me to the little extra for Danny Ings, actually. Yeah. I'd be surprised if I start with none of them. But I, I think the whole Danny Ings transfer scared a lot of people over the last it's, couple it's, of weeks. It's messed it up a lot because of formation and what... Well, the thing is, it's like, what formation do they play or what have you? Well, it almost doesn't... For Danny Ings, it doesn't matter because he's not getting pushed out wide or left. He's a striker... Oh, Watkins can play different positions. Bailey can play different positions. When they will play as a winger, Danny Ings is a striker, as a striker, as a striker. So it doesn't affect Danny Ings' positioning for Villa. Well, those who obviously tuned in for the Correspondent Week pods will know we recorded a little extra with our Villa correspondent, Lee Jackson, after Ings had signed for Villa. He sent me a DM after the game yesterday, and it, it was literally Ings... And the padlock. Okay. So he's saying Ings in for him. See, they started with a front two in the first half. And obviously Watkins went off with a knock. There was no Buendia, no Bailey. So Buendia is a bit of a doubt. Watkins with doubt. And you know what the worst bit of this is as well, don't you? Dean Smith. After last year with Grealish. Yeah, it might be back this weekend. (laughs) Was, Was he out for six weeks? Like, give me something, Dean. Tell me something. So it might mean for me, I paid a little extra for Danny Ings, actually. So on, the, on my original reaction, like everybody's, was, oh, Watkins has to go. Yeah. But then when we thought about it, was, well, they could play a front too, couldn't they? Or even actually looking at, even if Watkins does go wide, those first three fixtures are still so good. He can still get returns from out there. Of course he can. So I would still like to have Ollie Watkins, but I need clarity that it's going to be fit. Yep. Brentford. Tony? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. For game week one, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to go near Buena. Brighton, Sanchez. Sanchez and Steele um, as a double up, just to just covers you off. Uh, and Lewis Dunk. That's it for me. Veltman, I think it's very reasonable. I think Veltman over Webster 
if you were if you were making a choice of the four point five million defenders, Basuma is obviously going to be popular. It's four point five million midfielder. Um, I throw another four point five in there from Brighton, who we didn't actually even speak about. It's Sam FPL Seagull, but I was looking last night at the four point five million midfielders and and just asking the question of myself: if one of them was to break out and actually genuinely become an asset randomly, who's it most likely to be? And I decided it was Jakob Moda of Brighton, who, depending on system, could play wing back or in a wide position. And like he didn't start Brighton's friendly, so I'm not advocating him as a good choice. But he might be who I punt, because I might okay. just look at it. His ownership is nothing. I might just look at it and go, if one of them was to break out and actually become an asset, who's it going to be? And it could be him. So it's a name to throw in there. So he's on the list at the moment. Burnley, I've got no one. Yeah, me neither. Um, me neither. The only two on my long-term watch list were Nick Pope and Chris Wood. Pope at any time can start stringing a run together and Chris Wood's is decent value, but that's it. And Wood came back late from the Olympics. Pope injury, not, not really interested. Chris Wood's proving quite popular, I think, for many within the FPL community. And obviously he's proven over a number of years now his, his consistency when he... When he gets in a bit of form, he's good. And I think you look at the first game and go, Brian at home, I want to attack it, I want to attack it. And you can, by all means. I look at Liverpool away, Leeds at home, Everton away, Arsenal at home, Leicester away as the five fixtures afterwards and go, I don't want it. And Matt Lowton was back, which has killed any hopes for 4.0 Phil Barsley. Um, so Burnley are an avoid at start for me, particularly with doubts on James Tarkovsky as well, in terms mm-hmm. of whether he'll stay or not. Chelsea, Lukaku's on it, even if he's not on it. Yeah, exactly that. Kai Havertz, he's yep. on it. And Rudiger. I haven't ruled out Rudiger at five and a half. That I think that's very much if I decide to go really rogue last minute and go, no, I will not have Luke Shaw, but I can't see mm. it. I think Chelsea improved massively when he came back in the squad. he kind of been jettisoned by Frank Lampard. He's solid. He'll play every week. He's a bit of an attacking threat. He's very capable of picking up bonuses. They obviously have a really tough run of fixtures, two to six, where you don't fancy them for many clean sheets. But they had a similar period last year, didn't they? It was Liverpool, Manchester United and someone else where they had they kept clean sheets in all of them. So they are capable. And it might be one where I look at it and go, again, if I'm of that longer term thinking, OK, I've got defender there ready for that game week seven swing. But I think that's probably unlikely. And I think Havertz, Lukaku, it sounds like it's probably going to happen in the next couple of days. He's surely very unlikely to start game week one. I can't see they'd force him in. Um, Havertz, I think, is probably a one-week punt. Yeah. Of course, you could keep him through, but you just look at exactly what Ted at Rotation FPL say. You just look at them five fixtures and say, well, of course, they're one of the best teams in Europe, Chelsea, has obviously proven. Can they do well in those fixtures? Yeah, of course they can. But are they going to go big? I don't think so. No. Nah. There's no one really in the short term for me for Chelsea. Uh, Chilwell, Mason Mount, um, Tammy Abraham, I suppose you have to, uh, is on the watch list. Well, if he goes assume, somewhere. Assuming he's not at Chelsea, he's on the watch list. Uh, are there, but um, there's a strong chance, and we talk about uh, Liverpool in a bit, but Jota at 7.5 is in for me. And he might make way for Mount after a, a few games. It's going to be 5, 6, something like that. So, Nah, nothing more than what you've mentioned there for Chelsea, to be honest with you. Alice, no, nothing. No, not 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 short term. Long term Zaha, but not short term. Fixtures are too tough. I mean, Will Zaha apparently completely tore it up against Watford at Selhurst in a friendly at the weekend. But fixtures too tough to begin with, in my opinion. You could start digging into the 4.5s and stuff, but we know there are other good 4.5s at other clubs. So... They're a, they're a no for me, but an interest in watching the first few weeks. It sounds like uh, Norwich, Southampton, Palace are, are all trying to buy Adam Armstrong for £15 million from Blackburn. Um, yeah, it sounds the, like um, Palace have, are going to get him. Really? I thought I saw on Sky Sports News before we started recording that Southampton have agreed a fee. <laughs> oh, really? So I think he's going to Southampton now. Well, I think that would be the best move for him is, is Southampton, mm. actually. But uh, one to keep an eye on. I think the point being, though, is like if you're thinking about Benteke, who obviously his form at the end of the season was good, they are trying to buy a forward. That's quite yep. clear. Yep, 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 yep. Everton, I've gone really cold, mate, on, on the toffees. 
So Calvert Lewin at one point last week was in for me, but obviously was a no show at United. And Luca Dean, yeah, it's great fixtures, but again, I'm looking at that value. I was trying to force Dean in over Shaw. I'm not sure I can now. Am I going to go with both and Trent? Feels like it may be a little bit heavy in that position. I might start with none. So I mean, in terms of watch this now, it's literally Luca Dean for me. Nice, you're just pissing on my defence because I've got Trent Shaw and Luca Dean. Luca Dean will start for me. There's nothing wrong with that, and I'm not saying I won't start with that. I I know there was a lot lot of Manchester United at the weekend, Everton. Yeah, I know there was a lot of talk around um, Luca Dean not taking some corners and where's his attacking threat and whatever else. Rafa's a different. I'm just going to go with it, and Rafa being a defensive manager will just set up, even if he plays eight at the back or whatever his tactics are going to be. I think I'm going to I'm going to swing with Luca Dean. Okay, a lot no will, and I'm not. I'm no not saying else. I won't either. I'm not sure. I mean, those first three home fixtures: Southampton, Burnley, Norwich look look great. They really do, but I'm not sure they're in a good place. Fans were already chanting about Benitez at Old Trafford at the weekend, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's doomed to fail, I'm afraid, in my opinion. And I mean, what we learned from that pod with Sean last week at Spirit Blues about the financial problems suggest they're probably not going to be spending any money at least until they can get say Hammers's wages off the books or something yeah. so yeah. yeah it's not looking as positive for Everton as it might have looked a month or two ago Leeds well Ailing, Ailing and Lorente are in the watch list and then Lorente Dallas, I've taken off Dallas Harrison Rafinha Bamford that's the lot for me I've taken Lorente off because he keeps getting injured and still okay. my head in has he picked up a knock? Has he? I haven't seen that. Well, he so. got. I, I'm not sure if he played at the weekend, but I know he had a knock the week before, and he's right. Just a repetitive cycle, and I'm not sure I want to piss about with that. Trying to be clever, going against the higher owned Ailing again. When Ailing's obviously a decent pick, four and a half. So yeah, I, I haven't ruled out Dallas at all, actually, mm-hmm. at five point five, because we've said. Although I think there's a fair possibility he might start at fullback at the weekend. Once they get some of the defensive players back fit, he's going to go back into midfield. Yep. And he's actually capable of hitting double figures for a 5.5 midfielder. Like I think if Dallas plays 38 games in midfield, which admittedly he won't, but if you played the majority of them, he outscores like the likes of Smith Rowe, in my opinion. He'd actually mm-hmm. be the best 5.5 in the game. Yep. So I haven't ruled him out, but it's only 0.5 more for Harrison. It's only mm-hmm. 0.5 more for Rafinha. So I, I could start with treble leads. It's possible the closer it gets. They've obviously got a dirty game week one fixture and they've got a dirty game week four fixture. But I look at Everton at home in game week two with Ellen Road full and think that's not as bad as I originally thought it was. Burnley game week three away is also not as bad as I originally thought it was. And then they've got a really nice run from game week five to game week 10. And I don't want to have to be steaming into two, three at that period. I kind of already want it there. And if I if I go with Rafinha or Harrison, they'll play at the weekend. I ain't leaving them on the bench or anything like that because I think they're very capable in any game. And United are not; they're clearly not going to be up to full strength in game week one. I mean, Varane's not official yet, for example, is sure. he? I don't know what the state of the fitness is of like Sancho's probably not going to start, is he? No. Pogba, I guess probably does. Cavani, I'm guessing doesn't. He's not quite right for me there game week one so I, I don't mind Ailing I would leave on the bench but the attacking players I'd play them they start I'd Rafinha and uh, I'm like you James Rafinha and Ailing have been in the draft for a while and haven't moved and there's never been any consideration of a moving either um, the third player I'm going to wait and see I've got Ishmael Sarin at six million so if I am unhappy with his performance I can go to Dallas or Harrison or whoever else in a few weeks' time after game week five. But the first two, Rafinha and Ailing, they're, they're going in. They're, they're not coming out barring injury for, for game week one. Leicester? Well. This is a really interesting one, and I'll tell you why. Because Our heads were really turned at the weekend a little bit. That's the, 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 the three players that run the consideration for me for Leicester would not have been anywhere near consideration 10 days ago. Okay. Those are Daniel Marty. At 4.0, obviously Correct. played at centre back at the weekend. It's a short term, but then I'm looking to have a dead 4.0 player anyway. So if I get him at home to Wolves, and then okay, if he misses out once Johnny Evans fit, no problem. I mean, yep. even even if I left him on the bench and kept a clean sheet game with one, and would get some interest in him, which would be good. 
uh, and then it holds the value for you for a little while. Ricardo Pereira, mm -hmm. he's very much back in my thinking. I actually would possibly prefer him at this stage over Luca Dean. They've also got a good run of fixtures. First seven Leicester, bar Manchester City at home in game week four. Yes, West Ham away in two is quite tricky, but they've got a good opening seven as well. And the way they're playing now, with it looks like, and Aaron called this spot on at, um, last week, that Bertrand will probably start left back and left Pereira back. right back, which means no Castagne at the moment. Who I think pre-season would have been the one people most want to look at. Pereira, by all reports, has been very good for Leicester in pre-season, looking more like his old self. And suddenly at 5.5 .5 with good fixtures, that makes him really attractive. And I cannot believe it, Serge, but I think I'm going to end up starting with Jamie Vardy. I'm I'm right on board I, with that now. I uh, I would add in one other player that's on my watch list that off the back it's really off the back of Saturday, but I thought Harvey Barnes was was yes, uh, and Harvey million. Barnes as well. Yes, yeah, seven sorry. million. He looked lively. I think he needs to smarten up a little bit because Cancelo was doing him over a little bit with what you'd call streetwise tactics and just getting in his way. And you could tell Harvey Barnes was getting a bit wound up by it. But from a skill level point of view, I mean, I thought Harvey Barnes was excellent at 7 million and is going to be a player that I will own this season. Jamie Vardy is, is another one. I just, yeah, if I had the money, I would find a way to get Jamie Vardy in. So I don't, I don't disagree with that. I just don't think I have the money to get Jamie Vardy in. There's a couple of reasons why suddenly I really like Vardy. One is that with Barnes back, and obviously for Fana's really unfortunate injury, although this was happened before for Fana's injury, gone back to a back four, which, yes, makes Harvey Barnes really appealing, actually, again, because of those fixtures. Like, I actually prefer probably Barnes over Rafinha or Harrison for the first six or seven or so, but it might be a budget issue for me. Vardy, I really like because it looks like now he's going to be the one. It was probably a limit on expectations in he's probably only going to play 70 minutes or so. I think he's a possibility and we should be cautious of that. But I really like it for two reasons. One, it gives me an additional possible game week three captaincy cover of Norwich away. Whereas at the moment, I'm probably looking at Sun at home to Watford and depending on Tottenham's transfer business, that might not look so brilliant by the time it comes round. So I like having that additional cover and there were two very good exit points for Vardy to Lukaku. One is that, game week four, where Chelsea are still in the middle of their run, but Villa of Tottenham, Man City, before the run, I don't mind so much once he's up to fitness, if he shows form in the first couple. And also, obviously, game week seven, eight, which is when Leicester's good, good run ends and Chelsea's begins. I mean, Leicester at Palace in game week seven. And Lukaku has Southampton at home. So to be honest, you would make the switch in game week seven. Jamie Vardy at 10.5 million, in my opinion, is overpriced. It's too expensive, but it doesn't mean you can't start with him. Yep. And that's where my thinking is at the moment. And it leaves me, we obviously don't know what Lukaku's price is going to be. We speculated on it. I think probably 11 and a half. That leaves me close. I'm looking at it and going, if I go Ings and Lukaku to start with, for example, if Lukaku's 11 and a half, we drop Ings down to perhaps Jimenez and then uh, Vardy to Lukaku and I'm only 0 0.5 short of where I want to be for those two moves. That's part where I'm thinking at the moment. Mm. I, don't think Jamie Vard I, don't, I don't think Jamie Vardy is a particularly good pick. I think it's too expensive, but I just think it might work. Mm. For short term, I don't doubt that. And obviously it leaves you quite close to Harry Kane as well. And that's a conversation for, for another day. Who managed to get this far in the podcast? That's a conversation for another day. Um, so Liverpool. Well, Trent's uh, Robbo's out. Isn't he? Trent's so locked. unfortunate. Yeah, horrible. Trent, yeah, but if there is a case to, without the mate on the other side. There is a case to say no, but I can't see me not starting with him. It, it has taken away my headache of. I really dislike not owning Robertson when he's available. Correct. He's brought Schmickass to the table. Mm -hmm. 4.0. We got 4.0. It's similar to my thinking when I had Nico Williams last year, but 4.0 starting Liverpool defender has got to be under consideration. Mm. So suddenly he comes into the thinking. He has, if you listen to the Liverpool people in a know, he has had a decent preseason. But I also hear some other Liverpool fans say that it's more likely that James Milner will play at left back. 
Yeah. So he, he's really waiting on... They've got another fixture actually tonight, Liverpool. So I don't know if there's any more clues we'll get from that game tonight. It opens up Jota more than it opens up Skimikas for me, to be fair, because obviously you can only have three players. I'd had Trent and Salah already in. Couldn't get Jota because uh, Robbo was in there. Now I'm thinking, well, you know what? I've only got one place to go from Robertson in terms of budget, and that's down. So what am I going to do with that extra money? And uh, I can turn Smith Rowe. Like, if I went from Robbo to a five million, then Smith Rowe becomes Jota for a few game weeks. So I think Jota's back on the, on the list for me. I'll be going in more than likely with Salah, Jota and Trent as three Liverpool Jato obviously very much under consideration as Salah, as long as he's fit, is a is a definite. Uh Trent's almost definite for me. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not mind made up on Jota. I see it being a problem when I'm potentially looking at some potential transfers down the line. I don't want to be looking at Jota as a potential transfer, and I see it possibly being a problem. But as as Dan said to us, FP Loco Lord. He's probably going to start through the middle against Norwich, and it is very attractive. I can't yeah. argue that at all. Uh, he's probably a no for me, Jota, but I wouldn't be surprised by Friday if he's a yes. Yeah. City, avoid? Genuinely, no one. Mm, I've got no one. I, I, Maris is, is, is the one which I think people are most attractive by, and I can understand that because of um, his fitness. He disappointed a bit on Saturday, but you know his capability. And I think a lot of people looking at that Norwich fixture and going, I've got to have one. I don't like it. Like, I've gone completely cold on Ferran Torres as, as an idea. And now Grealish in the door. Grealish would be a no for me. Yeah, Don't no, like it. Got to get up to fitness. Remember with Jack Grealish as well, he was basically out for three months, played the last two games of last season. Yes, he obviously would have been training with England in the summer, but I think they were managing his workload as well and he didn't play that many minutes. He's obviously played 20 minutes, half hour. Does he start at Tottenham at the weekend? I'm not convinced that he does. I think they might ease him in a little bit, Grealish, despite obviously the 100 million transfer. That's why his ownership is so high. <laughs> Football has just been bought for 100 million. Um, I think you need to see more. If he's going to play every week, obviously he's interesting at that price, but he might well be managed through the season. I can't see it. I was hoping it was going to be things that became obvious, like Stones might have played at the weekend. No, no none of can't it. punt it. Is that genuinely, for me, I cannot see me starting with a Manchester City player. No. United. It's just Luke Shaw is the only one who's in for me at the moment as a, as a potential for game week one. Greenwood, I'm watching on. Mm -hmm. But I think he's going to be unlikely. I think, yeah, it will be Shaw for take me. you Jota over Greenwood, wouldn't you, at the same price? I think so, personally, probably, mm. yeah. But then you, you, you're then booking in the third Liverpool slot, which yeah. I, don't, I don't particularly mind doing, but spreading your bets is something that people would like to do. Bruno, as I've said, for me, it's too much money for someone I'm not going to captain other than game week four for the first 11, 12 game weeks. Now, of course, one argument against these people saying, well, I know I'm going to wildcard in game week three or four, for example, so, yeah, of course, he's got three great fixtures and you do not have to captain him. And there's no doubt that Bruno Fernandes will do well. No one's saying that for a second. I just don't think he's worth 12 million when I'm not going to captain him. And that's it. No. I know he'll hurt me. I know that. But there's lots of players that, that will eventually. Well, of course, yeah. Over the season, so. Newcastle United. Uh, no one. No one for me either. Uh, no. If I was even to go Sony to Calibre, Wilson, I'd, yeah. I'd find the money to get to Ings, to be honest with you, if I really was thinking about that. So, yeah, they're off the table. Norwich? Uh, just on Wilson, he's mm. he's arguably the clearest talisman in the game. He was involved in like 40% of their goals last their year. Goals. Yeah. So I completely get the appeal on that. It's not for me, I don't think. Norwich? Yeah, there's a couple. Our I'm friend, a Bamadeli. I'm a Bamadeli at 4.0. We think it's going to yeah. start. Um, and Billy Gilmore is a possible 4.5. I don't like that his ownership is kind of nearing 10%. Mm -hmm. But um, he's as locked as any of them 4.5s, I'd say. There's no way he's not going to play. That will appeal in itself. Yeah. So I think I think those two to start with, sit on your bench. Mm -hmm. Under consideration. Both possibilities. 
I'm a Bama Deli is probably dependent on what I decide to do with Leicester and Daniel Armati or Ricardo Pereira or if I don't go at all, for example. Yeah. Southampton. The no. only one that made it on for me would have been Ward Prowse, but he's obviously got an injury now and that's just uh, pointless. I mean, if, I, if they sign Adam Armstrong and he comes in at a silly price, what, five million, five and a half million, would you consider it? He won't. Okay. <laughs> it's just Simple as that, if, if, if Adam Armstrong came in at five and a half, yeah, I would consider him. Mm. Even with their tough fixtures, because I really like him as a talent and they'll he's rapid and they'll have games without a lot of the ball coming up because of the tough fixtures. So in a way it could suit him, but he wouldn't he won't come in at that price, mate. Chadham's at seven. He's not gonna come in. And Chadham's got no, no. interest in him. He's not gonna come in at five and a half, unfortunately. No. Um, so the only one would be Liveramento. Mm. At 4.0, with it with it being of the thought process that he's very unlikely to start the season. He obviously did quite well for him in a friendly at the weekend. And should something happen to either Walker Peters or the new left back Proud, then there is a possibility he could go into that team quite quickly. Um, but unlikely to start game week one as it stands. Right. Uh we go on to Spurs. So Sonny's in for me as a no, it's no buts. And that's it. Yeah, it, Sonny's a definite for me, unless I get something tells me in the next few days it is an injury doubt. Uh, the fixture suits in Man City, again, kind of similar to what I just said about Armstrong. He's performed well against them in the past, so that doesn't bother me. Not that I think we'll get anything at the weekend, but for Sonny, it's not particularly a bad fixture. The three afterwards, Wolves, Watford, Palace, are decent. His consistency is so underrated. He'll get 200-plus points again, and as I said to you on that Tottenham podcast, if Kane does leave and Tottenham don't buy a forward, I think he'll, he'll honestly he'll go close to being the top scoring player in FPL this year. Yeah. It could be, by the way, that by the time the window shuts, we're playing a 4-4-2 and he's holding the touchline on the left and he'll be a bad option. But as of right now, he looks a great option to me. There is nobody else in Tottenham I would consider. Watford. Ben Foster. Mm -hmm. And Saar. Maybe. Uh, he's another one I've gone cold on. Ben Foster, um, do you think he'll start or do you think just as a backup goalkeeper? No, backup goalkeeper. Um, so the other one I really like is Danny Ward of Leicester because I think there is a small possibility that he could get a move. I, th I think he's the sort of goalkeeper Southampton should be looking at, for example. They need a keeper. He's better than the two they've got, in my opinion. And he's kind of predicting a possible transfer i.e. him going there on loan or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. But if he stays, it's a Leicester position that I've booked in that I don't really want to. So as it stands, I think Foster's probably the best 4.0 because he's the most likely suddenly to get into the team. But I don't think he'll start. And what's made you go cold on uh, Saar? Options elsewhere. Okay. Quite it's honestly, not Saar himself, and but it's no, cool. and I, I think it, actually, to be honest, it's probably a case of having thought about it more. I prefer Harrison over Saar. Mm. I'm of the mindset at the moment that, uh, well, the way my squad is set up, um, there's every chance that one of Saar or Ivan Tony is going to be on the bench for game week one. And when I do that, then I think, well, what's the point in getting him? Like, I may as well just go cheaper and think about what I could do with the money with Saar. So, Saar's in for me at the moment, but um, if if he's going to be on my bench in game week one, then he may drop off and uh, I may get someone cheaper. And the other one that is under consideration, um, if the opposite well, Cucho. happens... Cucho's oh, under... Cucho. I haven't ruled Cucho Hernandez because he's five minutes forward and we think he'll mm. start. Well, I was going to say Josh King at five and a half because I think he might get minutes as well. But if I really if I decided Tony's going to sit on the bench and I'm never going to play him, then I may as well get Josh King over Ivan Tony for a million saving because that gives. Why me would you be leaving Tony on the bench? Um, because I've set myself up with fifteen starters. <laughs> don't leave even Tony on the bench. Like honestly, if you go for a player like that, I don't care if he's got Chelsea. Well, away, I'm more likely to I'm more likely to bench Saar than I am Tony. Don't get me wrong. And if I'm going to bench Saar, then I don't see. The it sounds like you can so. spread your money better, mate. Yeah, for sure. Um, West Ham United. I think for me, Soufell over Cresswell. Correct. Same for me. But, um, not, but probably but neither. Uh, yeah, exactly that. Ben Rama's the punty one. I, we, I really liked it. I spoke to you and Chris about it on the West Ham pod last week. 
you two kind of poured cold water on it a little bit. I hear he played very well again at the weekend. Again, yeah. yeah. He, he, he's, you talked about who could rise up as a uh, second season and have a, a breakout season. Um, I think not, he's right at the top. There's always someone very much who so. underwhelms in their first season in the Premier League and second season does very well. And when I think of all those players of, of who's been that, I feel like he's the one I can see being that player who has a great second season. So he's punty, don't get me wrong but I don't hate it. I think it's probably going to be a no for me on Ben Rama because I think I'm going to start with Antonio. And I'm not um, sure I want both. No. Antonio is as locked as locked can be for me at the moment. I know he's a, he's a potential injury risk, but what if he isn't? Um, so, yeah, he's looking fit, looking sharp, scoring goals, um, having the best time of his life. So Antonio for me is in. No, no, it's no buts. And the only Wolves player under consideration at the moment, and I haven't ruled it out, it's him and his consistency yeah, just i know again those first three are not great but, but I, there's a fair chance i'm going to want him for game week four and that's the only part of my thinking but i'd be very surprised if i start with him i think wolves are avoidable to start with till we know yeah. what they're doing i, I, I get even process. that we had we had bradley on and we spoke a lot about the, the four two 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 and then the next friendly after was played back three so that, there's even confusion now about how they might set up so i think it's avoidable at the start wolves I um I I'm not uh, completely against your Jimenez thinking, but for me the first three fixtures gives us a chance to have a look at Wolves, even in some difficult games before I go anywhere near Jimenez. So uh, I'd rather watch and wait and see. I'd take Wilson over Jimenez for the start of the season. Just I'm because I'm of, just fairly sure I'm going to want to buy him come game week four, and that's Correct. raising my my thinking. Mm. Yeah, no doubt about it. I can I can see that, but it's going to be difficult. Like, who are your strikers? You're thinking Vardy, Antonio, and who else? Tony Ings. Ings. So it's quite an expensive front line. Um, yeah. So Ings gives you an easy out to um, to to Jimenez. Um, Vardy gives you an easy out to Lukaku, and Antonio. You can go anywhere you want really. As soon as he gets injured, Antonio exactly. just sits there till whenever he gets injured. Till he gets basically. injured, exactly that. <laughs> I mean, imagine Antonio with a 38-game season. <laughs> it's no chance, as we've discussed. No, that's true. He would do so, well to make September, but any game, any time with that fella. And actually, in terms of the fixtures, looking at West Ham's first three, Newcastle, we don't know what's happened with goalkeeper. Leicester, I've obviously lost for Fana, and there's serious doubts about Johnny Evans. Palace at home is a little bit of an unknown. Then yeah. Southampton away in four. Yeah. Those first four fixtures for West Ham, actually, when you individually break them down actually are probably better than they look for yeah, Antonio. I think he's going to, he's going to do well in the first few. So, but he probably yeah. won't even make it to game week two because <laughs> he wears his shorts too fucking tight. Oh dear. Indeed. <laughs> I saw uh, our Crystal Palace correspondent tweeted a picture of uh, Wilf Zaha at the weekend. Um, have you seen this photo? No. He's having more of a short smell function than um, Antonio is. That's one for later. Go and find Migtavius. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, hanging out, is it? Uh, kind of, sort of, yeah. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Did you see Troy Dini's interview? Yes. <laughs> yes. Cajonas, indeed. Troy Dini. What? What's a lying bastard? This guy yeah. on, on Watford's uh, channel. If he um, was aiming for the far corner, <laughs> mate, well, then it was a shit shot. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was more likely to hit Canary Wharf or something. Honestly, oh, unbelievable. This guy said he was aiming for the far corner. I know it took a deflection. He had the goalkeeper all done. When you see the replay of it from behind the goal, it's blatantly just across. There's no yeah. way he's shooting. No chance at all. They clipped that into the same bit of the interview. That's what I loved about that as well. <laughs> there we go. Right, James. Episode one, season five. In the bag, a little rundown of our watch list for game week one. I'm sure a lot of those players are under the same consideration for many of our listeners. Anything else to add? Yeah, just that if we didn't mention the player you like, doesn't mean they're a bad pick. We've kind of listed who's under consideration for us. That's Indeed. all. So I feel like I have to justify myself to the Bruno herd. Yes. Because they're rah, 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 rah. You go with Bruno, go for it. I'm not going to. I wish you all luck. Um Coming up this week, tomorrow, as I said, we've got Callum Mates joining us. We're going to go into a bit more detail in terms of how our drafts look currently. Wednesday, Sky Fantasy Football Podcast returns, Season 3, Episode 1. Thursday, you're going to have a little bit of a deeper data drive into some stats from last season, something unplanet FPL-like. 
And then Friday, on deadline day, we'll go through our final drafts. I'll have a deadline stream for you at 5.30 on YouTube as well. And on Patreon, Q&A today, Tottenham tomorrow. Wednesday, we're going to look at a dead team. Thursday, we're going to look at a differential team. Friday, we'll do, as we always do on a Friday, our game week preview, which include information on the minus 56, which I know our patrons are, are very excited for at the moment. Fantastic. If you want to find out more about our Patreon, in which there are some uh, prize leagues, a Slack channel, the additional pods, as James has mentioned, and a bunch of other fun stuff, then head over to patreon.com forward slash planet F. PL. It would be lovely to have more of you involved in the Slack channels. There's uh, fans of pretty much every single club in there that can give you insight and advice around your transfers and so on. So um, it's a great community to be a part of. We'd love to have you there. Well, Callan, who won the advanced tier mini league, has basically got our patron for two years free. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. Uh, he had a couple of... Um, manager of the month in amongst that as well so he yeah, did, he's, yeah he's done all right up. um make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening whether it's youtube soundcloud stitcher spotify whatever it may be hit the bell hit the subscribe button and whatever it may be and leave a few comments whether you agree disagree or what you like in youtube as well other than that stay safe ciao for now thanks everyone be nice to each other remember to play it your way cue music please man child